Good evening, and welcome to this week's Pilgrim Baptist Church Midweek Bible Study. My name is Minister John Lowry, and truly I give honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and to our illustrious pastor, uh, the Reverend Dr. Lonnie E. Rector, uh, for this opportunity to be with you once again. Uh, tonight's lesson comes out of the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 20, chapter 32, verses 22 through 32. Uh, Genesis 32, starting with verse 22 through verse 32. And the title of tonight's lesson is Jacob Called Israel. And it's a story that most of us should be somewhat familiar with. Um, I will be reading uh, the text in its entirety, and I will be using the King James Version this evening. And it reads, And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jabuk. Then he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, This is Jacob, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and has prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, what is thy name? And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed them there. And Jacob called the name of the place Penel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penel and rose, and the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore, the children of Israel eat not the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. This is the word of God for the people of God. And so as we get into tonight's lesson, I think to uh, fully appreciate it, uh, it's important for us to understand the character of this man, Jacob, as well as the relationship between him and his brother Esau. Um, you got a taste of that um, last week, during that lesson, and um, I think, you know, it's important to kind of reinforce that uh, for tonight's lesson. And so, you know, going back to Genesis chapter 25, when um, Jacob and Esau were in their mother's womb, they were at odds even then. And, you know, God had blessed um, Rebecca, who had previously been barren, and, um, you know, she was happy and, and, and joyful that she had conceived, um, but she knew that something wasn't quite right with, with her, her pregnancy. And so she went to the Lord in prayer and said, you know, Lord, what's going on inside of me? And God told uh, Rebecca that she was going to give birth to two babies, uh, which would represent two nations, and that one would be stronger than the other and that the older would serve the younger, which is a reversal of Hebrew custom. And so we know that Esau was born first and Jacob came out grabbing um, his heel. And that name Jacob, um, you know, again, na names in the Bible, uh, even names in today's uh, society uh, are meaningful. And oftentimes in the Bible, they describe the person's character. And so in this particular case, Jacob's name uh, was quite fitting. Um, Jacob's name meant heel grabber and, or trickster or deceiver. And you saw in last week's lesson how Jacob coerced Esau into selling his birthright, um, the birthright that belonged to him as the oldest brother or as the oldest son 
uh, and he sold his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup. And then later, Jacob would conspire with his mother, Rebecca, and together they would trick their father, Isaac, into giving Jacob the blessing that really belonged uh, to Esau. And so when Esau learned uh, what Jacob had done, uh, he swore that he would kill Jacob. And fearing for Jacob's life, his mother, Rebecca, sent Jacob to live with her brother, Laban. Um, she, Jacob went and lived with his uncle, uh, his mother's brother, Laban, for 20 years. And during this time, Laban gave Jacob a taste of his own medicine. Um, again, many of us know the story. We know that um, it was love at first sight when Jacob saw uh, Laban's daughter, Rachel. And he had agreed to work seven years for Laban in exchange for Rachel's hand in mar marriage. Um, it wasn't until the wedding night when uh, he learned that um, Laban had tricked um, Jacob into marrying the oldest daughter, Leah. And so Jacob had to work another seven years in order to get um, Rachel. And that was just one example of um, how Laban, I guess it's called Laban, Laban took advantage of Jacob many times during that time, that, that 20 years that, that Jacob stayed with him. But God, even then, was with Jacob and blessed him to be a wealthy man. And God communicated with Jacob and told him to leave his uncle and to return to the land of his people, uh, the land of Canaan. That God And God promised Jacob that he would be with him, uh, not only then, uh, but always, uh, and especially when he went back into the land of Canaan. In fact, when Jacob left, Jacob left uh, Laban, a wealthy man. Um, God had blessed him in the form of livestock and servants. And uh, J Jacob left his uncle with a lot more than what he had, in addition to his wives and um, his children. And so Laban got wind of Jacob leaving, and, and he chased after him with the intention of doing Jacob harm. But once again, God intervened and resolved the conflict. And so that conflict was resolved. And as Jacob was heading back to the land of Canaan, uh, he was going to be faced with another problem. And see, in order for Jacob to return to Canaan, um, as God had commanded him to do, and in order to be obedient to God, it meant that Jacob was going to have to face his brother Esau whom he had cheated 20 years before. And, and obviously Jacob didn't know how Esau was gonna feel about seeing Jacob again. Um, didn't know how he would be received, uh, given the fact that Esau had threatened to kill Jacob uh, for stealing both his birthright and their father's blessing. And so Jacob, uh, as was his nature, decided to depend on himself to win over his brother, despite God's promise that he would be with him. And so Jacob decided that he would suck up to his brother by showering him with flattery and with gifts. And, and so Jacob sent his servants ahead and he sent his servants ahead to give Esau a message. And that message can be found in uh, the same chapter, chapter 32, in verses 4 and 5, which read, And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus unto my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants. And I have sent to tell you, my Lord, that I might find favor in your sight. And then verse 6 says, The messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is also coming to meet you. And he's bringing 400 men with him. And so this wasn't the message that um, Jacob was hoping to hear. Uh, definitely wasn't the, the message he was looking for. And so when his servants came back and said that, you know, your brother Esau is coming uh, to meet you, and he's not coming alone, he's bringing the army with him, um, to say that Jacob was terrified would be an understatement. And so Jacob automatically assumed the worst. Um, not only was Esau coming to kill him in Jacob's mind, but he was bringing an army to kill Jacob and his family and his servants and to take all that Jacob uh, possessed. 
And so instead of remembering the promise that God had made Jacob and, and Jacob, um, God had also reaffirmed uh, the same promise, the same covenant that he had made with uh, Abraham and Jacob's father, Isaac, that um, Jacob's people, his offspring, his descendants would become a great nation and that God would bless them and that God would always be with Jacob. Instead of finding comfort in that and, and using that to strengthen his faith and his resolve, Jacob immediately fell back into his natural instincts, which was to come up with yet another scheme. And so, you know, it's easy to be uh, hard and, and, and judgmental when it comes to Jacob and, and some of the lapses that he had. But, you know, if the truth be told and we look at ourselves, you know, how many times do we fall back on our natural instinct when faced with a problem? Um, we try to resolve it on our own. We try to resolve it on our own behalf, even though God promised to be with us, even though he's fixed things for us repeatedly. Um, when we're faced with the problem, problem uh, we sometimes have the tendency to fall back to our own means and to our own devices. And so Jacob um, did just that. And so Jacob uh, came up with one of his schemes that he was going to divide his family and his servants and his livestock into two groups. And he would have one group travel in front of the other. And the rationale behind this, his reasoning was that if Esau did attack uh, the first group, the first group would be the one that would get killed. And Jacob, being in the second group, would have time to get away. And so, you know, this was Jacob's plan. Um, again, he was resorting to his own resources, to his own devices. And so as a last resort, <clears throat> Jacob decided to pray to God and ask him to deliver him and his family from Esau. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so how many of us uh, turn to God as a last resort? instead of our first resorts. Um, again, let's not be too hard or too judgmental when it comes to Brother Jacob here, because uh, we have all had our moments of, of being Jacob. And so the problem with Jacob is that he never learned to depend on God. He never learned to trust God. He never learned to have faith in God, even though he was uh, desperate enough to pray. It didn't mean that he had faith. He, he was praying out of desperation. Um, he figured he had tried everything else. And so, I might as well take this to God in prayer. And so even though he prayed, um, he didn't have faith that his prayers was going to change anything. And we all know that prayer does change things. And so how do we know this? How do we know that he didn't have faith in prayer? Uh, because immediately after he prayed to the same God who his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac had served, and they had undoubtedly taught Jacob about, um, he went back and immediately uh, resumed his plan of trying to suck up or uh, appease his brother. And so this time Jacob sent his servants back to Esau, but this time they didn't go empty handed. This time he sent gifts consisting of hundreds of livestock, uh, again, to try to appease his brother. And so when we look at tonight's text, um, and he rose up that night, and took his two wives and his two women servant and his 11 sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And so this um, caravan of people that were traveling uh, with, with Jacob and uh, all his belongings, uh, they had camped at the edge of the river Jabbok. Um, the Jabbok River was a branch or a tributary, tributary of the Jordan River. And when verse 22 says he got up, um, you know, you can read that one or two ways. One, either Jacob was too stressed out to sleep or, or two, as being one who mastered the, the art of deception, he got up in the middle of the night to put his feeble plan into action under the cover of darkness. And so Jacob sends his entire family and servants and all his possessions across the river to continue their journey into Canaan. And so this leaves Jacob alone with his thoughts and his fears. And, you know, sometimes God has to isolate us um, to reflect on our actions. And, and when, when God gets us alone, 
Um, he even causes us to reflect on our lives. And he has a way of getting us to see ourselves as we truly are. And so Jacob had time to reflect on all that had transpired um, up to this point in his life. Um, he, had, he had a troubled relationship with his brother Esau from birth. Um, he had a troubled relationship with um, his uncle Laban or Laban, Laban. I know why I'm tr struggling with that um, for 20 years, Laban. Even his relationship with his wives and his female servants um, was strained at times. And so in Jacob's case, you know, if, if, if he was honest with himself, and I believe that during this evening, um, you know, he had a um, one of those people called a come to Jesus moment where, you know, he opened his eyes and saw himself as he truly was. Um, and that's not easy, something that's easy to do uh, for somebody like Jacob. Uh, like I said, we've all played the role of Jacob before, and um, each of us have had our moments like this where we had a chance to reflect on our lives and, and see ourselves as we truly are. And so in Jacob's case, it wasn't that he had an Esau problem, and it, it wasn't that he had a problem with Laban. Uh, it wasn't even that he had a problem with his wives. Jacob had a Jacob problem. And, you know, God couldn't use Jacob the way he wanted to use Jacob the way he was. Uh, God couldn't use Jacob until he fixed Jacob, until he got Jacob to change his ways. And so this is why God got Jacob alone. You see, when we're alone and, and when we're barely hanging on by a thread, um, when, when we're alone and we've exhausted all of our resources, this is when God can fix us. And so when you look at verse 24, uh, verse 24 says, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the break of day. And so this wasn't the first time that Jacob met God. Um, 20 years earlier, Jacob had met God when he was alone in Bethel. And God came to Jacob in the form of a dream. And we're all familiar with the story of Jacob's ladder and all that he saw. And God spoke to him then. And again, I mentioned this earlier, but this is when he reaffirmed the covenant that he originally made with uh, Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, and with um, Jacob's father, Isaac. And in this covenant, God promised two things that, again, his descendants would be a great nation and that God would bless him and keep him wherever he went. And so here we are 20 years later, and God graciously blesses or basically visits uh, Jacob again. Um, and see, God will meet us wherever we are. Um, he'll meet us where we are in order to lift us up to where he wants us to be, no matter how low we might be. And so when we look at this, this verse, verse 24 talks about a man um, that he wrestled with until the break of day. And uh, at least in the teacher's edition, I don't know if they have this in the uh, student Sunday school book, um, but the Sunday school book uses a theological term, uh, the term uh, theophany, T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-Y, theophany which means the sudden and temporary appearance of God uh, to man in a form that they can, um, they can comprehend. And so in this particular case, we find out that God appears to um, Jacob in the form of a man. Um, and sometimes he appears in human form. Uh, sometimes he doesn't, like in the case of Moses in the, the burning bush. And so when you look back through the Old Testament and you look at um, you know, even going back to Abraham, uh, when Abraham was a wanderer, um, you know, he was a traveler. Um, God announced that he would uh, bless Abraham and Sarah uh, with a son named Isaac, even at their advanced age. Uh, he came in the form of a man or a traveler. And you can find that in Genesis chapter 18. And then when Joshua was preparing to lead the Israelites in the battle, uh, God appeared to him as a soldier. And you can find that in Joshua chapter 5. And so now, uh, because Jacob has spent a good portion of his life 
wrestling with others, wrestling with his brother, wrestling with his uncle, wrestling with his, um, his wives and his servants, God appears to Jacob as a wrestler. And Jacob has spent most of his life resisting the will of God. And so he was totally reliant on himself. And, you know, he was reliant on his schemes to get him out of trouble. And, you know, God wanted to fix both of these character flaws so that Jacob could be totally dependent on him. And so dropping down to verse 25, it says, And when he saw that he had prevailed not against him, this is the angel. When the angel saw he that he prevailed not against Jacob, the angel touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled him. And so um, this is the um, God. This is the uh, pre-incarnate God, or you know, many will say this is the pre-incarnate Jesus. But either way, it's God that's wrestling him. And so God puts an end to this wrestling match by basically dislocating uh, Jacob's uh, thigh or his uh, hip bone, rather. And so God answered Jacob's prayer uh, for protection from Esau, but he didn't do it in a way that Jacob um, had expected him to. And so God answered his prayer um, by wrestling with Jacob until he left him limping. And so, as I mentioned earlier, Jacob's plan had been that if Esau attacked one group of his um, of his caravan, if you will, Jacob would be in the other camp and he could escape. He could run and he could hide and he could live to fight another day. But now Jacob wouldn't be able to run even if he wanted to. Um, and so God has a way of working on us in ways that we would never expect uh, or, quite frankly, ask for. And so God, God has to break us of our self-dependence. Um, God wants us to be totally dependent on him so that he can bless us as we cling to him in our brokenness. And so it was to this point where, you know, Jacob was emotionally and, and spiritually broken, if you will. Uh, but now on top of that, he's physically broken with his hip being um, put out of the socket uh, by God, uh, by a divine touch. And so that brokenness that, that Jacob is going through is going to be his path to blessing. Um, you see, because when you look at it, before God can use us and use us in a great way, uh, before God can use someone to do great things, oftentimes he has to break them first. Um, because we all have that natural tendency to trust in ourselves. We all have that natural tendency to be self-reliant. And again, God wants us to be totally reliant on him. And so dropping down to verse 26, and he said, let me go. This is the angel, or this is, this is God talking. This is God uh, in the flesh talking. Um, he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And Jacob said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And so, like I said in verse 25, you know, sometimes God has to break us. Um, he has to get us out of our um, self-dependency um, so that he can bless us. And when he breaks us, that's when we cling to him. Uh, we cling to him tighter than we've ever clung to him before. And that's when God can use us. That's when God can open our eyes. That's when God can change our heart. And that's what Jacob is about to experience now in his brokenness. And so at some point during this long struggle, you know, you have to believe that Jacob, Jacob starts to suspect that he wasn't wrestling with an ordinary man. And I, and I, and I believe that if he didn't figure it out before um, his hip got dislocated, uh, he figured it out then when God just basically divinely touched his, his thigh bone or his hip and it went out of socket and it, it was dislocated. And so Jacob knew that he would never be as close to God again. Uh, he knew that he had never been this close to God again, and he refused to let go until God blessed him. And so in verse 27, uh, the God, I can't keep calling him an angel. This is God, uh, God in the flesh. He said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And so again, I think Jacob had time for self-reflection. Uh, first, when he sent his family across the river. Uh, and then uh, once he started uh, to wrestle with God and wrestle all night long, 
Um, you know, I think initially he probably was surprised that this uh, man came out of nowhere and started fighting him, started wrestling him. And, you know, I don't know if he feared for his life or not. And, you know, they say um, that sometimes when you think you're going to die, that you start to reflect on your life where people say your life passes in front of you. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but I think Jacob had time to reflect. I think Jacob had time to look back on his life. I think he had time to uh, do some soul searching about his behavior and about his um, about his his lack of character, his shady character. Um, you know, living up to his name. And when God asked him what his name was, I, I think that's finally when Jacob realized that his name was the root of his problem. Not so much the name itself, but the fact that he had been living up to his name. And so that name hill grabber or deceiver was exactly what Jacob had been up until this point. Um, he would deceive anyone, uh, he would use anyone. And so you even look back to um, the last time in uh, Genesis when it was recorded that somebody asked Jacob what his name was. And if you remember uh, when uh, Jacob and his mother, Rebecca, uh, connived and, and came up with a scheme or plan to uh, fool Isaac into thinking that Jacob was Esau in order to give him uh, the blessing that belonged to Esau, um, Isaac asked, who are you and what is your name? And Jacob lied and said he was Esau. And so this time, Jacob answered truthfully and said, my name is Jacob. My name is the deceiver. My name is the trickster. My name is the, the heel grabber. And, and, you know, God asks questions, not because he doesn't know the answer, because we all know that God is omniscient. He knows all things. But he asks questions in order to give us an opportunity to confess and to repent. And so point in case, go back to uh, Genesis in the garden. Um, once um, Adam and Eve had sinned and they had eaten of the uh, forbidden fruit and um, they realized that their, their eyes were open, they realized they were naked and they ran and they hid. And, and God came to them and said, Adam, where are you? Well, first of all, God is God. God knew exactly where Adam was. And Adam said, I heard you coming and I knew I was naked and I ran and hid. And God said, well, who told you you were naked? Again, knowing the answer to his question. And so he was given uh, Adam the opportunity to confess and, and to admit uh, what he had done. And that's exactly why he had J asked Jacob uh, the question, uh, what is thy name? And, and Jacob, again, recognizing that his name, uh, the fact that he had been living up to his name, uh, that his name perfectly described his shady character, uh, admitted that his name was Jacob. And so in verse 28, uh, verse 28 says, and he said, thy name, this is God talking, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, hast thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. And so in the Bible, um, receiving a new name signifies a new beginning. And so this is Jacob's opportunity to make a fresh start in life. Um, God changed his name to Israel, which we know uh, became the name of the Hebrew people, uh, Israel, the nation of Israel. And when you look at that name Israel, there are a couple Hebrew translations for Israel. Uh, first one is wrestled with God and prevailed. And so prevailed not in the sense that he was more physically powerful than God uh, and that he physically defeated God because God is all powerful. And we know that God was holding back. Uh, he wanted to test um, Jacob. He wanted to see just how long Jacob was going to hold on. He wanted to see just how long Jacob was going to try to act independently instead of embracing God and, and asking God uh, to change his life. And so uh, he prevailed against God in that he got the blessing um, that he didn't deserve, right? But he didn't give up on his opportunity to get closer to God. And he prevailed in getting a blessing that he sought. And so the second translation um, that I want to cover is um, God fights. 
Israel can translate to God fights and that God would fight for Israel. Um, and there are other variations that um, our textbook presents, uh, but I'm just going to stick with those two uh, for now. And so moving on to verses uh, 29, 30 through uh, 32, the last four verses of our lesson. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed them there. And verse 30, and Jacob called the name of the place Penel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore, the children of Israel eat not the sinew which shank, which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the fly of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. And so in verse 29, um, we see Jacob asking for confirmation of who he had been wrestling with all night. But he knew it was God, um, but he figured he might as well ask for confirmation while he had the opportunity. Um, but the Bible says that God declined uh, to answer. And so then in verse 30, once again, uh, Jacob is giving a special name uh, to a significant place. And the text says that he called it Penel which means the face of God. And so Jacob thought that seeing God's face would bring death uh, because that's what the Bible teaches. Um, but it actually brought him new life. Uh, he didn't see God in his pure form. He saw God in a form of a man. Um, and so it actually brought new life. It, it brought a new opportunity um, to, to Jacob to start over, if you will. And so when you look at verse 31 and it says, um, as he passed over Penel, the sun rose upon him. Um, you know, it was a new day uh, for Jacob. It was the dawning of a new day uh, for Jacob, now known as Israel. Um, he got three things out of this wrestling match with God. He got a new name. Um, he got a new walk, right, because he was limping. And many believe that his limp uh, never went away, that uh, he limped for the remainder of his life. And then finally, he got a new relationship with God. And so his wrestling God was not in vain. And so as I conclude this lesson, um, you know, I mentioned earlier um, that the name in the Bible um, often was important. Um, there was significance to the names back in physical times. Uh, and there, there's significance to names in the 21st century, uh, but more so in the Hebrew culture. Um, some of the reasons why names were so important in the Bible uh, was because a biblical name sometimes recorded the aspect of a person's birth. Um, or, you know, biblical names sometimes expressed uh, the parent's reaction to the birth of their child. Um, another thing is that a biblical name can be used to communicate God's message. Um, in the name of Israel, God's fight. God, God will fight for Israel. Um, you know, so that's important. Uh, sometimes names in the Bible were used to establish an affiliation with God. And biblical names are sometimes given to establish either authority over another person or to indicate, as in uh, Jacob's case, a new beginning or a new direction for a person's life. And so, you know, two examples that we're familiar with uh, in the Bible, both in the Old and in the New Testament, is the Apostle Peter. Um, Peter's situation is significant because um, Jesus gave him another name. He, he didn't just merely give him a new name or replace the old one. He also named him Peter. Uh, and so uh, Peter was sometimes known as Simon. He was sometimes known as Peter. And at other times he uh, was known as Simon Peter. I believe that when uh, Peter uh, begins his, uh, either his first or second epistle, maybe both, um, he uses the term or the name Simon Peter. He uses both names. 
And so when you look at Peter, um, when God, when Jesus called him, uh, you know, Peter was a fisherman. He was, um, he was brash. He was, uh, you know, he would, he would, he was a brawler. He would fight you in a moment's notice. Uh, he carried a knife. Um, you know, he cussed. Uh, he was undependable and he was, was very, very opinionated and outspoken. And so you can say that when Jesus first met him, um, Peter fit to a T uh, the description that uh, James um, put in his, his epistle of a double-minded man uh, who's unstable in all ways. And so uh, that name Peter meant rock. And the name was significant, and, and Jesus had a specific reason for choosing it and, and a specific reason for giving it to Peter or to Simon. And so from that point on, um, that name Jesus used when speaking to Peter um, was he, he sent a message to Peter, depending on which name he would call him. And so if, if Peter was acting in a way that uh, was unbecoming, if he was acting um, like his old self, um, when, when Jesus first called him, you would see where Jesus would call him Simon. Um, but if, if Peter was acting like uh, a disciple of Christ, if he was acting like uh, one who would be called an apostle, when he was acting like uh, one who would be considered one of the leaders in the first century church, uh, then Jesus would call him Peter. And so from that point on, Jesus would gently either rebuke Peter by calling him Simon or commend him by calling him Peter uh, just by using one name or another. And so talking about the significance of a name. And so, and then tonight's lesson, Jacob, um, you know, after God changed his name to Israel, uh, there's still sections in chapter 35 and beyond where the text still refers to him as Jacob, even after his name had been changed by God to Israel. Uh, there were passages that referred to him as Jacob and other passages would refer to him as Israel. And so, you know, he was referred to as Jacob when his behavior mirrored his old carnal nature. Uh, because it's not included in our lesson, but even after God blesses him and changes his name and, and, and you know, Jacob has this new walk and he's he's about to embark on a new spiritual life. Um, he still resorts back momentarily to his old ways and he goes back uh, to trying to appease his brother Esau. Uh, but when he was called Israel. Um, he was acting according to this new nature, uh, to this new man, this new uh, servant that he had become. Uh, but like us, when we first accepted Christ, when uh, we got that new name of disciple, uh, when we got our, as pastor would say, our second birthday, um, we didn't start walking, um, you know, as we should be walking right away. Uh, it took some time for us to mature as Christians, as disciples of Christ, and no doubt, uh, the same was true of Jacob. And so finally, you know, as disciples of Christ, as Christians, uh, that term Christian, pastor reminded us on Sunday, means Christ-like. Um, and as disciples of Christ, we should always strive to live up to our name. Um, and so that means that, you know, our thoughts and our actions uh, should be Christ-like, uh, the way we walk, the way we talk should be Christ-like. Uh, the way we think uh, should be Christ-like. Um, people should see us and be able to tell that we know the Lord, that we have been in the presence of Jesus. And so if our walk and our talk is not reflective of our name, um, if, if we're not living up to our name as disciples of Christ or as Christians, then we need to be intentional about our devotional life. Amen. Uh, we need to get be about prayer. We need to be about um, studying God's word. We need to be about um, applying the words to ourselves and asking the Holy Spirit to apply the word to ourselves uh, because only the Spirit of God can change us um, uh, through word, through the word and through prayer. And so we need to spend more time communing with God. Um, that's the only way that we're going to mature as Christians. Uh, we need to be uh, about, again, devotions with God. Um, that needs to be as important as our day as sleeping and, and eating and, and, and bathing. 
Amen. And so we need to spend more time with God. Um, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us grow in Christ so that we can better live up to our name. And so with that, I want to thank you uh, for thinking out robbery to tune into this lesson this evening. And um, again, I want to thank Pastor Rector and I thank uh, my God for uh, allowing me to be with you once again. And so as we go into prayer, um, as we hear every day on uh, the Mindful Noonday Prayer, there's, there's much to pray about. Uh, there's many people in our church and our church family uh, who are still going through a season of grief, uh, a season of sickness, um, recovering from surgery. Um, and they're just struggling um, to, to, to make it um, in the midst of all that's going on in this world. And so we want to continue to pray one for the other uh, in corporate uh, prayer and intercessory prayer. And so with that, let us bow and go to the Lord in prayer. Eternal and everlasting God, Lord, it's once more and again that we come before your throne of grace, Lord, thanking you for yet another opportunity uh, to come to you in prayer. We thank you that uh, we don't have to go through uh, a high priest or we don't have to have someone uh, make intercession on our behalf, Lord, that we can come directly to your throne of grace, uh, knowing that this right uh, is made possible through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, um, our mediator, Lord. And so, Father, we just thank you right now, Father. Father, we ask you to just continue to uh, remember those names that we lift up uh, on a daily basis, Lord. Continue to bless uh, the bereaved families, Lord. Lord, you know their names. Father, continue to bless the sick. Uh, you know all about them, Father. Continue to bless those who are recovering from surgery, Father. We ask you to just touch them and heal them like only you can. Father, we ask you to just bless the congregation of Pilgrim Baptist Church as a whole, Father, that we might continue to be uh, about your business, Father, that we might continue to be uh, devoted and faithful servants of Christ, Father, that we would not hung up on um, church work, Father, but that we would focus on uh, the work of the church, which is Christian studies and evangelism. And so, Father, we thank you right now for our pastor and his family. I ask you to continue to bless him and keep him, Lord. Uh, continue to bless uh, the ministries and the leaders of the church, Father. Continue to bless um, our communities, Father. Uh, continue to um, squash the violence, uh, the senseless violence, not only in Ukraine, uh, uh, but in the streets of Philadelphia, in the streets of Wilmington, in the streets of many major cities and smaller cities in this nation. Father, we pray that you would heal the land, Lord, uh, that you would heal the land, that you would um, bring reconciliation between uh, the races, that you would um, bring reconciliation and peace uh, to Ukraine. Um, that you would continue to bless all of those who don't know you, Father, and that you would use us um, as your uh, disciples and as your ambassadors uh, when we go outside our four walls into the world that we might preach and teach a dying world about Jesus. And so, Father, we thank you for tonight's lesson. Uh, we thank you for the lessons to be learned uh, from your servant Jacob, Lord, and that we know that we cannot be uh, self-dependent, Lord, that without you, Lord, we are nothing. Uh, without you, we can do nothing, but through you, we can do all things. And so we just thank you right now uh, for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for love, grace, and mercy. And Father, as always, as we depart from this place, but never, ever, ever from your presence, we ask you to go with us, be with, lead, guide, and direct us, and we'll be careful to give you all glory, honor, and praise. It's yours and yours alone. It's in the matchless and majestic name of Jesus the Christ that we pray and let every heart say, amen. And may God bless you and may heaven smile upon you until we meet again. Take care and good night.